the very thing, the very thing that the universe, the entire universe is constructed upon. But what really is love? So, Maulana Jalaluddin Rumi says, for the elect, love is a tremendous eternal life. For the common people, love is a form of sensuality. Now today on this show, I have a very special guest coming all the way from the United States of America, a Muslim Sheikh in the name of Sheikh Muhammad Hisham Kabrani. Now this is not your ordinary Muslim personality. This is a special Muslim personality we're hosting today on TV3, Iqra, live from Addis Ababa. Sheikh Muhammad Hisham Kabrani is a prominent scholar of mainstream traditional Islam. He spent his life spreading and teaching the teachings of peace, tolerance, respect, and love. That are the message of Islam throughout the world. In the United States of America for the last 20 years, Sheikh Kabani has continued to disseminate the light and peace of Islam's spiritual dimension to people of every background, ethnicity, race, and belief. Sheikh, assalamu alaikum. It's an honor for us uh, on TV3, uh, particularly on Ikra, to have you on the show today. Thank you very much. I like that number three. Thank a, you. A, a whisper number. Thank you very much. Uh, once again, uh, let us, uh, we, we, I started to introduce this show with the message of love. And coincidentally, you've been spreading them and teaching the message of peace, tolerance, respect, and love all over the years. One might, you know, get a little bit worried or confused. Are you teaching anything different from what it is that's supposed to be taught in Islamic jurisdiction? No. We are following the mainstream Islam, mm. and we are following what Prophet Wasallam as it is mentioned in Holy Quran, A'udhu Billahi Minash mm. Shaitan Rajeem, Bismillahi Rahman Rahim, Qul, In Kuntum Tuhibbun Allah, Fattabi'uni Yuhbibkum Allah. So, Ittiba'un Nabi, follow the footsteps of Prophet, leads to Allah's love. So, Allah mentioned it in Holy Quran. If you really love Allah, follow Muhammad, وسلم, Allah loves you. So, uh, love of heaven is not love of dunya. So it is completely a different dimension. Mm. So we are urging people to drop little bit, not too much, the love of dunya and give some time to the love of Allah and love of Akhirah and love of Prophet You are the U.S. leader of the Najabandi Haqqani Sufi order. Now, um, what, is, what is the Najabandi Sufi order? What is the Tijani Sufi order? A question for a question. Yeah. What is the Qadri Sufi order? What is the Muridiya Sufi order? What is the Samaniya Sufi order? What is the Shaziliya Sufi order? What is in the subcontinent Chistiya Sufi order? It's, it's, not, it's, an, it's not something different, mm. but it is, goes back to the university, if we can call in modern terms, to the, to the head of that university who established that school and that student teaching them in Bukhara. So Muhammad Bahadin Naqshaband, he established a big school in Bukhara 1,000 years ago for students who come abro from abroad to study Islam. So it was called after him the Naqshbandi school, as we call he is Azhari graduate from Azhar, or he is uh, med uh, from Muhammad bin Saud uh, University. He, we can say Saudi background, Libby background, in this university back, Harvard uh, background. So it is the name of the school. So we, we got the name of that from the one that has uh, disseminated this kind of knowledge. Now, in, in, um, in Islam, some Muslims are of the opinion that Practicing in the Sufi order is sometimes not well understood. So we have, you know, quite a few number of Muslims or a number of Muslims who want to see the Sufis 
in another different light. Would your help today? I would like you to help us understand. You know, when we say this is a Sufi Muslim, what does it mean? Those who want to play with the fire, mm. they can play with the fire with any small issue. Mm. So Sufism is nothing else except that theaterness. Mm. It took the term Tasawwuf, and the first person to bring that is Abu Muhammad Hisham al-Madani, a Sufi in 125 Hijri. He brought that term in order to to people to understand, because it is taking as uh, is from the main uh, uh, goes back to Safin. Saf means pure, crystal pure, or from the Suf of the wool cloth that you, they used to wear in the desert in Saudi Arabia today, uh, in the time of Prophet ﷺ in Hijaz. So they used to wear this clock there for and go in the desert worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as Prophet was worshipping in Ghar Hira. So this is a purification of the self, nothing else. It's a self-realization, like Prophet was a self-realization of his Lord. He wants to understand the situation he is living in and to worship one that is the creator. So Tasawwuf will guide you through the message of Islam, uh, through the five pillars first, and then go ahead beyond that. And I am so surprised to find in the West, not in Africa, but in the Western country, that they don't speak except only the five pillars of Islam. When they say, what is Islam? They say to you, five pillars. Okay, that is the first level. Where about the second level, which is Iman, belief? And then where is the third level? The state of moral excellence. So this moral excellence is what we call Tazkiyat al-Nafs in the Holy Quran, what we call Tasawwuf in the terminology that's been used after the time of Prophet is a changing terminology. As many other words in Islam today, they have been changed into different terms that's been practiced before in different terms. Now today it's practiced in different terms. Like the Holy Quran came with how many different qira'ah? Came with, the, with seven up to fourteen. So if someone from the Middle East countries, if he is going to hear someone from the Western countries, Africa, in Morocco or here, uh, he can see some, some changes. He might say, oh, this man is making a mistake in Holy Quran. But it's not right. in the Tashkil. Right. It's a different way of dialect. Right. So also the terms in Arabic changes in different tribes because the Quran came on different tribes. Prophet was for different tribes, so he can use. He was using different terms, and that's why it's not something different than the Maqam al Ihsan, the state of moral excellence that teaches you how to worship Allah better. Like when you say Allahu Akbar and you enter in the prayer, can you tell me, anyone can tell me that his heart is not going out from the prayer and thinking about his bank account, about his car, about his wife, about his children. Maqam al ihsan try to concentrate and zoom, zoom you in. This is a new word we are using today. Zoom in. Or zoom up. Zoom out. It was not in the time previously. So zoom in means concentrate more right. and me in tafakkur. That is the tafakkur. Uh, we were we just tuned in. You're watching Iqra live on TV3. My guest today is Sheikh Muhammad Hisham Qabani, the U.S. leader of the Naqshbandi Haqqani Sufi um, order. A man of diverse achievements. A man who I believe is doing very much to make sure that the world is a very peaceful place to live. Sheikh, where were you born? I was born in Lebanon from a family, very, very religious family, and uh, from uh, uncles that they were the official, high official religious uh, figures in Lebanon and Middle East. Were you, did you grow up in, to a, a very religious family, like Sufi, Sufi, Sufi practicing family, or were you introduced to Sufi? No, uh, my uncle who was the head of the ulama of Lebanon, 
You know, everyone at that time when go to Azhar uh, and study in Egypt, it was a, a, a normal study. Sufism it was tasawwuf. It was normal for everyone to have a sheikh and to take the hand of a sheikh, like today in the national uh, uh, national chief imam. Uh, everyone knows he is a Tijani. And they go and take uh, his hand there and uh, listen to what he says. And, it, uh, and they, they take his tariqah, even his order, and they become Tijani people. It doesn't mean they are changed, they are not Muslim. So my uncles were on that high caliber of, uh, of uh, Muslim religious leaders. So I grew in that environment where my uncle, one of them, he was uh, the big, uh, the chief imam. And he was teaching the four school of thought to scholars only. Okay. Only scholars from around the world, like I see in his association when I was young, go to visit him. 150, 200 scholars come from around the world. They study all mazahib. He teach them one day this mazhab or the other day the other mazhab and so on. So I grew in that environment and they were Naqshbandi coming from a sheikh in Egypt from Azhar University. Who was? Um, there has been uh, Sheikh Muhammad Hisham Kabbani who will be taking uh, a deeper insight as far as his accomplishments are concerned. Stay tuned, we'll be right back. You were the Prince Charles four weeks ago. Yeah. Okay. I will ask you a question. Then. Okay. All right. Okay. Okay. All right.
Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuhu and welcome back to Iqra Live on TV3. My guest today is Sheikh Muhammad Isham Qabbani, the US leader, Naqshabandi Haqqani Sufi order. Um, Sheikh, before we went for the break, we were looking at uh, where you were born and the kind of family into which you actually grew up. Before I proceed with my next question, let me look. This man is, is a very special man. He holds so many positions, but let me take a few. The U.S. leader, Naqshabandi Haqqani Sufi Order, the chairman, Islamic Supreme Council of America, chairman, As Sunnah Foundation of America, chairman, Kamilat Muslim Women's Organization, we will talk about that, the president, the Muslim Magazine, co-chair, Council of Muslim Leadership, advisor, Unity One, an organization devoted to ending gang violence, that's very important, and advisor Human Rights Council USA for supporting the establishment of human rights and freedom in all nations. Among so many other things, co-founder Sufi Muslim Council, SMC. So many things. How do you manage um, all these all these positions? How do you manage them? You are like my wife. <laughs> she complains a lot. That's right. You know, how to manage. Yes. Yeah. Alhamdulillah, we have a lot of uh, uh, very good uh, volunteers mm -hmm. that they are assisting in that. And they are, uh, they are of good uh, uh, education and uh, they, have, they can support themselves mm -hmm. without... Uh, they have some revenue that comes to them. So they are able to go around and uh, be able to do this work with me. And that's why I depend a lot on them. I, I saw your profile early in the week. Um, some photographs that I saw, I saw fantastic photo shots with uh, President Bush, with uh, President Barack Obama, with so many prominent personalities in the world. Four weeks ago, you were with Prince Charles of England. What did you talk about with Prince Charles? Uh, that's a long story. Mm. Uh, it is uh, this. Uh, it goes back to two years of. Mm. Uh, knowing each other and I met with him several times on many occasions and uh, I uh, uh, how I became to be introduced to him because I had uh, gave a speech on modernity mm. and uh, in his academy Terminus Academy in uh, London mm. and I think he liked the speech a lot so he invited me to uh, to visit with him. So we were from that time, two years ago, visiting each other and uh, he is so interested in uh, Sufism and, uh, and all other religions at large. But uh, he likes that spiritual realm of, uh, of, uh, uh, of understanding the self and the self-recognition and self-realization. So from that point of view, I uh, recommended that if we can put for him an event that Muslim community, he can visit the Muslim community and he accepted and we prepared that event it took like uh, one year of preparation uh, it was in Manchester and we have we invited all uh, different uh, leaders from the Muslim community in England uh, from various walk of life from different country backgrounds and uh, there were some from Ghana also. So they attended that uh, event with him. It was two part, one part, to meet with him personally, the leader. And then he comes in the public room, main room, to meet with everyone else. And we were also uh, singing some kasidas in Arabic and in English on the love of Prophet Wasallam. And he attended and he left uh, and he was very, very, very happy with that event. In 2008, you were invited to the United Nations to speak um, at an interfaith dialogue um, towards a global family, uh, a Buddhism-Muslim dialogue. Um, what, what was the feeling for you, I mean, stepping into the UN building to deliver a speech to a large audience of people of diverse beliefs, all gathered in one room? I will tell you the few, the truth. Uh, I have a double... Uh, feelings, uh, different feelings 
with the building of the United Nations, not with the people that they are there, but with, with this uh, entity, it works very hard for, for political issues and so on, and also humanitarian issues. But there is a one dimension of which is, I don't know why they feel like, like that. So in that meeting, particularly with the Buddhist and Muslim, we entered there, it was very welcoming, and, uh, and uh, we were sitting in, the, in this big hall and discussing the issue of uh, uh, bringing people together and so on. And uh, I quote, when I spoke, I quote many ahadith and many verses of Holy Quran about the issue of relationship and so on. And uh, the, the zakat, because they want to know how you share with other people your money, and we explain the system that Islam teach us of, uh, of zakat, of salaka, jariya, of gift, hadiyah, and hiba. So we explain that. Uh, that was a good meeting, but before that I was invited to a meeting, and when we went there, it was Salat al-Zuhur. So, the, when you enter, it's a huge hall, so we took a corner, we were praying. This before 2001, mm. uh, what happened, what That's I'm right. saying now, there was no violence, nothing. Mm. It was year 2000. So we went to pray, and they ran to us and they said, no, you cannot pray here. They will, we have to pray. They said, there is no God here. In this building, there is no God. So this is another side That's right. of the, the United, impression of that you have of the United Nations. So the second impression is 2008 was very nice impression. Mm -hmm. But that year, 2000, it was really not happy. Or physically so um, for over 25 years, you've been representing your teacher in the United States of America. You live particularly in the state of um, help, Michigan. Michigan. Now, um, Islam has, has taken different phases in the United States of America. I mean, what it was 40 years ago is not what it is right now in the United States of America. If you should walk the street of America dressed like this, a grand Sufi chef. What do people think of you? They come and take pictures of me. <laughs> so many people, they like the way we dress, mm. and they are amazed, and they take pictures. Mm. Before 2001, 9 11, uh, I invited my chef to America. And the pilot was so happy with him seeing him dress this kind of dress, he put him in the, on the cockpit uh, and uh, behind the uh, wheel of, if you can right. say that, That's of this plane. Right. And he put his hat yes. over the sheikh and took the sheikh's hat and put on his hat. <laughs> so it was, it is, I, I don't feel problem. Mm. I don't see a problem. I go everywhere. I go to the State Department, I go to the White House, I go to the FBI, I go to all different uh, places. Uh, everyone respects. But in general, yeah, there is, there is, a, there is a, a, some kind of misunderstanding. There is misunderstanding. And this is the duty of the Muslim community to, to show that, no, Islam is different. Uh, it, it was their mistake before because they were so complaining and criticizing. Now today you cannot find any more in mosque a complain or a criticize. They are more shaping and polishing their speeches better in order to accommodate themselves within the United States. Mm -hmm. Chef, you are a man of um, so many accomplishments. Let me mention but a few. Um, you founded the Sufi Live TV channel which broadcasts Sufi content to hundreds and thousands of people online every day. You met with His Royal Highness Prince Charles to discuss the importance of Sufism in Islam and to promote universal spirituality for mankind. So many things I can't just mention. Met with the team UK Prime Minister Tony Blair to share viewpoint on the situation of Islam in the United Kingdom and Europe. Let me go to the next page for the lack of time. You also uh, the key speaker at the forum on the evolution of Wahhabism at Johns, Johns Hopkins University, 
Central Asia Caucus Institute. And some of your major accomplishments include founder of the most watched, I'll mention that, let me go to the second one. You founded an Islamic retreat and healing center on a 200-acre farm in Michigan, established the American branch of Hakkani Educational Foundation. You're also the founder of Kamila, like I mentioned earlier, it's an international Muslim movement organization. Uh, so many things, so many, 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 many things. I can't, I can't just mention all of them. What is different about you, your approach, that makes you um, welcomed and received by all? I don't know. Mm. <laughs> it's be something, they ask this question. Many people ask this question. Even scholars in uh, Los Angeles, in, uh, in different parts of the world, and meeting with presidents and prime ministers. I don't know how this will pop up, but it's happening. Mm. Does, it, does it have anything to do with your Sufi background? It might, mm. uh, of course, because uh, uh, we, we, I don't know, but uh, it, it's something that attracts them. Mm. Uh, and they attract, and to be attracting someone or to attract people, you have to feel their feelings. Mm. So God has given me some kind of inner uh, uh, power mm. that I can read their heart. And, and I can read some of their minds, their thoughts. Mm. And I can speak what they like to hear. Mm. This is how you can attract the people. Mm. And then you can introduce to them Islam. Because from beginning to introduce them Islam after what happened 9-11 is very difficult. Absolutely. So, but when you bring to them the spiritual dimension of Islam. Now we as Muslims, we go from five pillars to six, five pillars of Islam, six pillars of Iman, the last pillar of moral excellence. Mm -hmm. For them, we begin with the highest one, moral. the moral excellence, because they like that. And then we go into the belief, we give them the belief. Mm -hmm. Then we go into the five prayers and fasting and the, all the different things that we do. So if from the beginning you want to give them the five pillars of Islam, Prophet David in 23 years, it's not something easy to, to, to ask them, don't go to the church every Sunday, come and pray every day five times and wake up at Fajr. It's not, it's not easy. It's not easy. So we go from the top to bottom, they like that. If we go from the bottom up to top, then it's difficult for them. So this is the technique we are using. Wonderful. Um, I, I, I gather also that you were, in, you were called back, you know, to the United States recently when this Nigerian thing came up. It seems like um, authorities out there would want to believe that you have some solutions to some problems. I mean, this global um, chaos that we're facing right now. Let me ask you this, this very important question. How the Sufis answer what is that what is Sufism's own answer to the global problem that we have right now for everyone to look to himself mm -hmm. you don't have the right to look at others man arifa nafsahu faqad arifa rabba who knows himself knows his lord al fitna tu naimatun la'ana allahu man aykadaha fitna is dormant allah will curse who will bring it up so our duty is to always keep the fitna down as dormant, keep it dormant, not give it some fuel. So some Muslims, out of different Reason. reasons they would have in to, their mind, would want to wake up the lion fitna that would cause problems to the entire human population. Let's go for a short break, we'll be right back. Please.